Okay. Awesome. Can everyone see my screen? I should have asked that right away. Okay. We have the agenda on our screen, just in case any of us get lost. Um, we try to keep these uh, the meetings short but productive. Uh, we're, we're joined by two wonderful speakers, um, one who's close to home now, and uh, Karthik, who is a little bit further from home uh, in Austin. So, and we checked, he, could, he, he was able to make it to this one. I was a little worried with all that's going down in Austin. Um, yeah, I'm very excited to see everyone here. Uh, it's, it's been a great month. We had a, a January meetup that went really well with uh, two speakers and posted it online. If, if for any reason you or your colleagues can't make this, we're trying to make sure all of these are recorded for posterity uh, and posted online. Um, Dave, do you wanna talk a little bit about? Yeah, um, so we do have a code of conduct. So we invite all those who participate in the Seattle DevOps meetup to help us create a safe and positive experience for everyone. So you can see our reporting guidelines and full code of conduct at seattledevops.net slash code of conduct. And next, who is hiring in the audience? If you're hiring, put the position, title, our titles, the company name, and contact information in the Zoom chat. Or if you want something less ephemeral, post to the jobs channel in the Shadow DevOps Slack. And then for Q&A, um, we're going to save Q&A for after the speakers. Just post your questions in the Zoom chat, and we'll propose them to the speakers. That was well said, Dave. Um, we actually had a number of folks who were joining us uh, in January who were looking for roles and the number of folks that were also hiring. So we just want to make sure that we're giving a forum where we can and uh, uh, the chat's a great place for it. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm actually really excited to introduce Jeremy. Jeremy's here from Circle CI. They have been kind enough to sponsor today's event. Um, we have given him two minutes for the floor, and uh, without the sponsors, we wouldn't be able to keep these meetings free and accessible to everyone. Uh, so I'd appreciate your attention, and I'll turn it over to Jeremy. Cool. Hey, yeah, thank you. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, wish hope Hopefully soon it will be able to be in person, uh, but glad to be here. Uh, if you haven't heard, you know, so I'm, uh, as, as Jason mentioned, I'm Jeremy uh, at Circle CI. I'm the head of DevRel uh, in community there. Uh, if you haven't heard of Circle CI, I think at this point probably you have, but uh, we, you know, kind of the spiel is uh, software teams around the world use Circle CI to deliver quality code. Uh, it's, we're kind of the largest continuous integration and delivery platform, uh, empowering engineers to seamlessly take ideas to execution at scale. Every feature of our platform is built to fine tune the entire dev process from start to finish. Uh, if you want to know more, can find uh, I'll, I'll be around you can ask questions um, in the chat we are also hiring for all sorts of roles uh, everything from SREs to director of security to uh, system engineers to you know all all range there so I put that into the chat and um, and yeah you can also find me on uh, the Twitters at I am Jared dog uh, and yeah, that's what I got. Thanks for thanks for you know having us and uh, glad you know definitely glad to be here. Look forward to hearing the uh, great speakers. Jeremy, if I could talk you into dropping your uh, Twitter handle in the chat, I'm yeah, sure absolutely. Some colleagues who would love to follow you and uh, keep up abreast. Um, and I know there's plenty of people who are looking for new roles. So especially when it becomes a little bit easier to virtually travel to some of these places. So that's right. That's right. For sure. Well, yep. All right, if uh, I, I think we're a little ahead of schedule. Um, uh, Nell, are, are you up if I go and introduce you? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, uh, Nell was probably someone who I've had the chance to meet with most back in our, our days when we could go to in-person meetups at Chef. Um, looking very forward to this talk. Um, so th the talk is titled, It's Only Hard Parts Now, Harnessing Community to Thrive in a World of Complexity. I'm looking forward to it. Um, Nell, are you a co you are a co-host. I will be quiet and let you take over. Thank All you. right. Hello, everyone. Let me go ahead and share my or start. Let's let's share my screen first, then let's start the slideshow. Uh, so I'm going to take over that, and 
let's do this. All right, let's start my show. And let's switch displays. And we can see it now, it's looking good. All right. Well, hello everyone. I'm Nell Shamrell Harrington. I'm currently a principal engineer at Microsoft. I started there uh, in October. Uh, prior to Microsoft, I was briefly at Mozilla for about seven months before I got hit with the August layoffs, uh, along with quite a, quite a bit of the company. Uh, but prior to that, how I know some of you, I was at Chef for five years, uh, working as a community engineer and the community engineering lead there. So it's great to see some familiar faces. I've been missing my DevOps friends horribly. And let's go ahead and uh, dive right in. It's nice giving this talk at a DevOps event because DevOps, we it, it, with DevOps, we know the value of a community. We know how community is absolutely vital to solve the problems that we face. But not everyone knows that. Do you remember the film Jurassic Park? There's this wonderful moment in it where one of the characters sits down in front of a computer and exclaims, it's a Unix system, I know this. And using her Unix skills, she saves the day. I remember wanting to be that girl. I wanted to be the tech superhero who would know the critical answer when it was needed. Throughout the 90s and the early 2000s, as a tech culture, we really embraced the idea of the lone tech genius, the person who can solve any problem if given a little time, a little space, and a lot of caffeine. This image still persists in some places today. And the problem with it is it misses a critical point. All the big technical problems that could be solved by one person have all already been solved. Even though we may not have realized it at the time, those were actually the easy problems. Now we have to face the hard problems. And as our world and our connections expand, it's only going to get harder. The reason for this is we have shifted from dealing with complicated systems to dealing with complex systems. When I say a complicated system, I mean a system that is knowable. A complicated system has many parts, but the way these parts are joined together is relatively simple, as General Stanley McChrystal states in his book, Team of Teams. Technical problems used to be complicated problems. If you got the right person with the right understanding of the system, they could solve nearly anything. However, the problems we face today in technology and out of technology, they're no longer complicated. They are complex. A complex system is not knowable. A complex system is constantly changing and is tightly integrated with other complex systems. Think about a system of microservices. Think about a system or think about systems of hundreds or thousands of microservices that must integrate with each other and interact with each other as each of these services grows and changes. And a system's complexity is not limited to its technology. It also includes how real living and feeling human beings interact with it. Humans create these systems. Humans use these systems. Humans need to evolve and change these systems as the world evolves and changes. We need communities of humans to make these systems possible. A good example of a complex system is an open source ecosystem. These ecosystems are sprawling networks of libraries, plugins, services, integrations, and much more. They are also made up of people, individuals and teams who use and contribute to the software. One of my favorite open source ecosystems is that of the Rust programming language. I, we just announced the Rust Foundation recently and I'm on the board. So if you wanna uh, know more about Rust or the foundation, please feel free to reach out to me after the talk. Rust is most well known for being a back-end systems programming language, but that's not all it's used for. People use it for everything from embedded hardware to web applications and much more. It is wonderful to see Rust used so widely, but that also means that any changes in the Rust ecosystem have the potential to profoundly affect different projects in different ways. This makes it a very complex environment to work in. Despite the complexity, 
the reason Rust is successful and continues to grow is because of our incredible community of coders, technical writers, community managers, and many more people. The ultimate leaders of the Rust ecosystem are the Rust core team. And in 2018 at RustConf, they presented on the difference between open source by serendipity and open source on purpose. I took the liberty to rephrase this as community by serendipity versus community on purpose. Open source communities or any community can seem like they form spontaneously. And that is how they often start. In the early days of the Rust project, we would sometimes get a pull request out of the blue without any action on the part of the maintainers that happened to implement exactly what we what the project needed at exactly that time. It was serendipity and it feels really, really good when that happens, but it's not sustainable. Like any organization or relationship, no matter how magical it seems when it starts, you have to work at it in order to make it last. For a community to not only stay strong, but also grow and evolve, it must be cultivated and nurtured intentionally. It just won't happen on its own. We must do it on purpose. Over the years, I've noticed three common things that every community must do in order to last. And the first can be summarized as ask and point. We need to not only ask for help, we also need to point people to where and how they can help. In the open source world, it's just not enough to tell a potential new contributor, oh, just pick up a GitHub issue and start working on it. Trying to solve any project's issue without at least some context is not only hard, but it also feels extremely risky, particularly if a person had a bad experience with another open source community. A new contributor just does not know how people will react when they submit that pull request or when they ask questions, and it can feel very unpredictable and very scary. One of the ways we ask and point in the Rust community, one of the ways we combat the scariness is through labeling issues as easy or good first issue when we triage them. These are usually fairly contained in one section of the code base. Someone can work through them without needing to know the entire project. Additionally, we also often assign an experienced contributor to serve as a mentor to anyone who wants to work on that issue. Having a defined mentor introduces a feeling of safety. It lets contributors know they will not be alone. They will have someone to call upon for context and for help. Another part of making sure people don't ever have to feel like they are alone is making a space for the community, a place where they can work together and help each other. I first heard this phrase, make a sp space, also from the Rust core team. In Rust, we use a mix of chat applications, forums, and GitHub itself to propose ideas, discuss those ideas, help each other, and guide the forward evolution of the Rust language. Again, this is something we have to do deliberately, creating the space and making sure one, people know where it is, and two, that they can where it is, and two, how to interact with the community. In order to make sure those interactions stay constructive and safe. We must set guidelines for how the community interacts with each other. Part of this is through having a code of conduct. Any community that does not have one should have one, but it doesn't stop there. Communities will change. And part of executing that change without alienating your community is through having processes that ensure every voice has a chance to be heard. One of the ways we do this in Rust is through our request for comments or RFC process. This is how we decide as a community how the language evolves and how we operate as a community of people creating a technology. When someone wants to make a change, they write it up and then submit it as a pull request to our RFC GitHub repo. Then the whole community has a chance to comment on it. That's why it's called request for comments. And if you are thinking that that has the potential to get unruly, it does. I have dealt with some unruly RFC uh, discussions. But the key thing to understand is that the whole point of an RFC, the reason you open one, it's to find the best solution. The point is not to win an argument. The choices on an RFC, 
it sometimes can start off seeing like it's okay we either do this or we don't do this but that's that might they may start that way but that's not how they stay very long rfcs often change profoundly as they respond to and incorporate feedback from the comments more often than not, when it first seemed like we only had those two choices, we find a third way, a way that the person who opened the RFC or any individual in the community did not have the full context to consider. The reason we depend on the whole community to respond rather than a select few individuals is because the most valuable comments we receive come from someone's lived experience. I first heard this from Aaron Turan, a prominent Rust community member. Remember, as I said before, Rust is used in many different ways for everything from systems programming to web programming to game programming to Internet of Things programming, embedded programming. No one in the community can individually hold all the context for all the different use cases in our minds. We must have the context of the whole community in order to develop the best solution. Once the request for comments period is over, Someone still does need to make the hard decision of whether to implement the proposed change and how to implement it. This is this decision is to, is the responsibility of the Rust team that is responsible for that area of the ecosystem. The team's job is to consider all the perspectives in the discussion and still produce a strong and coherent design. It's important to remember that comments on an RFC are meant to inform the eventual decision. They don't dictate the decision. Again, the purpose is to find the best solution, not to win an argument. At its core, an RFC is a mission of discovery. It's a way for us to map the whole problem space before we decide on a solution. Now it's hard, sometimes it's really hard, but the solutions we ultimately create are so much better as a result. Now at this point, you might be thinking, it, this, it, doesn't this process take a really long time? The truth is in the Rust community, most of the time it does. But the Rust community has the luxury of being able to move slowly to ensure that we do the best thing rather than the quick thing. Other communities, however, must move much faster. And one of my favorite examples of a, a recent example of a very fast moving technical community is the Cyber Threat Intelligence League or CTI League. This is a very recently established global community with one specific goal, to neutralize threats exploiting the current pandemic, especially attacks on healthcare facilities. Now, I personally believe there is a special place in hell for people who attack hospitals in the middle of a health crisis, but these attacks are happening. And the CTI League is a group that is working to stop them. In their own words, this is an unprecedented global emergency. Those of us in the cybersecurity community have come together to protect those on the front lines who are fighting for us. The COVID-19 cyber threat landscape, as you can probably imagine, is a very complex system. We need, to we need to address this complex system by neutralizing, oh, I am going back a little bit. We need to neutralize this complex web of cyber threats that take advantage of humans who are fighting a very complex biological threat. No one person or one group of people could possibly do this on their own. It takes a community to respond. When they form the community, the founders of the CTI League follow the same three steps I mentioned earlier. First, they asked for help, and they made sure to ask for that help in channels where people they wanted to recruit were likely to be. I personally heard about the League through the CyberWire podcast. Then they pointed anyone who was interested to a web form to apply. There was one specific place for people to, to go for people who wanted help, or who wanted help and who wanted to help. Once an applicant was approved, there is a vetting process. The nature of the work, there does need to be a vetting process in place. They were then added to a Slack team. And this Slack team is the space where the community gathers and works. Together, they are constantly detecting and responding to threats, both to technology systems and to human systems. The CTI League was founded in March of 2020. 
And after only one month of existence, they had already recruited and vetted over 1,400 volunteers from 77 different countries across 22 time zones. This means if someone needs help, they can reach out to the league and no matter what time of day it is, they can get a response nearly instantaneously. The work this league does together includes scanning the infrastructure of healthcare facilities for vulnerabilities, monitoring the dark web for compromised credentials being posted or sold, and more recently monitoring the dark web to look for vaccine scams creating block lists that facilities can download and implement to block known attackers, investigating phishing campaigns, and when needed, initiating a domain takedown process to neutralize them. Their work also includes, as I alluded to earlier, tracking disinformation campaigns. I am sure everyone here has noticed there's a lot of weird stuff going around about the pandemic. There has been for this in the, during the entire process, like the idea that 5G cell towers cause COVID-19, among others. These campaigns are causing real world harm. And in order to neutralize them, we have to track them and understand where they are coming from and how they are spreading. So that's another thing that the CTI League does. And they also respond to malware. When malware is detected on a system, they need to analyze it both to figure out where it came from and how to stop it, how to neutralize it again. And there's much more they do, especially as the league has developed and grown over the past year. There's more than could fit into any one presentation. The CCI league is a complex system responding to very, a very complex threat. And as part of that response, they have also set guidelines for communication. When you're dealing with something like cyber or security threats, you have to define what information can be shared, who it can be shared with, and what information must be kept private. You generally don't want people tweeting about an ongoing attack as when it would potentially make the attack worse. The nature of this work dealing with active cyber threats means they must define what can be shared and what cannot as clearly as possible. And how they do this is through a system we actually all learned about in kindergarten. The traffic light protocol or TLP. Information that is labeled as red absolutely cannot be disclosed. Yellow information that's labeled as yellow allows for limited disclosure. Often it's something that can be shared with the organization that's being affected by it. Then green means the information can be shared within the CTI league community, but only within the community, not publicly. And finally, white means that disclosure is not limited. It can be shared publicly. When everyone has the same clear context, it makes things so much easier. The CTI League is both a very young and very effective technical community. And this may lead some of you to ask, doesn't forming a community like this only work with young organizations? There's clearly value in cultivating and nurturing community. I think I'm preaching to the choir about that here. But what about established organizations like enterprises that are very set in their ways and procedures? Well, over the past year, year and a half, I have been working with an organization that was established in 1775. This organization is older than the country that it is in. It's the US Marine Corps. I do want to pause and say, I know using examples involving the military can be difficult for some people. History teaches us that a lot of technical and management advances were discovered in an environment of war. Whether we agree or not, these discoveries made new things possible across our industries and our world. It's important to acknowledge and understand where they came from in order to learn from them. The Marines have always operated very well in the traditional domains of warfare, air, land, and sea. They've been operating in these domains since their inception. In the 20th century, they added space to the list of domains they operate in as a fourth domain. And within the last two decades, a new domain of warfare has emerged, and that is the cyber domain. In this domain, the traditional command and control structures of the military do not work. 
new methods of engagement are needed. To their great credit, the Marines realized they needed to change to respond to new threats and they needed help to do that. Last year, they started bringing in volunteers from across the tech industry to train, educate, advise, and mentor Marines. This is critical for them in order to keep pace with constantly evolving cyber threats and challenges. These volunteers make up the US Marine Corps Cyber Auxiliary Unit, which I am very proud to be a part of. We are a community of volunteers who lend our industry expertise, both in technical tools and in culture change needed for a technical organization to be as effective as it must be. When the Marines have a question either on technology or practices around technology, they now have a community of over 200 auxiliaries to draw from. We auxiliaries come from many different backgrounds, but what we all have in common is that we are always ready to answer the call for help. Many organizations know they need to change, but they don't know how to do it. This is especially true in highly secure environments like in the military. The only way I've found to be able to do that type of change is through having a community to draw on. Even if it needs to be a private community of vetted individuals, it is still a community. And frankly, if the United States Marines can see the need to ask for help and create a community in order to fulfill their mission, your organization can do it too. Back at ChefComp 2020, I said this, community is vital to every business in every industry. That was ChefComp 2019, rather. And this remains true. But after the experiences of 2020 and the beginning of 2021, I've altered this statement to community is vital to every single human being. This pandemic that we face, that we continue to face, it's not only one of the greatest physical threats we've ever encountered, certainly within my lifetime, but it's also one of the greatest psychological threats we have ever seen. We are forced to isolate ourselves from each other. This is hard. I imagine just about everyone watching this has been affected. As a culture, we tend to focus on individual acts of heroism, but no individual can possibly solve this enormously complex crisis alone. No matter who you are, no matter what your occupation, occupation you yourself have a duty to help. Your community, whether it's your family, your friends, your coworkers, whomever that community is made of, they need you. I need you. We need you. No matter what your situation, no matter how much you are hurting individually, you have the power to do something, to lift someone in your community up. Text them, email them, Slack them, set up a Zoom call, uh, invite them to something like one of these meetups. It's okay if you don't know what to say. Simply telling them that you are thinking of them, that you care for them, and then asking what do you need is enormously effective. And doing this, it won't only help them. Connecting with another, another human being will also help you. So much is out of our control, is still out of our control right now, but the ability to lift someone up even just a little bit, that is within your power. Together, what we can do is limitless. And it starts with small actions, small ripples in the fabric of our communities and our world. Remember, as ripples combine together, they turn into waves. And waves, as they come together, transform into seas of change. Start a ripple today and tomorrow and every day after that. Answer the call. Thank you. Thank you, Now We really appreciate that. Sure. I did see there were some chats coming in, but I couldn't see. Yeah. Well, uh, we have time to go through that right now. Okay, I cool. That there was a question about the RFC process from Jeff. All right, taking a look. Used by the IETF for almost half a century. Uh, I am not familiar with the IETF uh, uh, RFC process to, uh, to t uh, tell the truth, but I'm very interested in finding more about it now. Anyway. Well, so the, the uh, RFCs was something that was created back in the late 1970s as a mm -hmm. bunch of computer experts 
who were getting together for requests for comments. And um, TCP IP was invented and was first published in RFC 821 and RFC 822. And I think UDP was in RFC 824 or something like that. They're now up to something like 7,000, something or other. And they're in no particular order. Uh, if you want to have find a question in the RFC database, basically you have to go to Google and ask them. But you can see all these arguments going back and forth over decades. And that is how the internet, as we have come to know it, has been uh, created. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at the, the, the RFCs stretching back half a century, and I listen to what you're talking about right now, it sounds very, very similar. It very, very, very likely similar. is. It's very likely derived uh, mm -hmm. from that same process. Mm -hmm. So how it's different, I'd have to look more closely. How mm -hmm. the Rust community operates a little differently than many other communities is we're a community where personal maturity and empathy are as important, if not more important than technical excellence. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is a distinguishing aspect of the, Rust, of the Rust community, but I'd have to look more at the other RFC uh, system in order to articulate on the differences. But I'm, it's, it's great that it sounds similar because it's clearly worked. Uh, oh, absolutely. A few more comments about RFCs. Um, but I don't see any more questions. So I think we're going to move on to Karthik, uh, who I was fortunate enough to meet at the final velocity in 2019 when we both worked for ACI. So I'm really looking forward to hearing about Kubernetes and operators land because that's what I'm beating my head against at work right now. Take it away, Karthik. Thanks, Dave. Um, I actually had a question for for Nell real quick sure. um, on the um, on the RFC stuff. Um, I, I keyed into the part where you said that you know, like the point of the RFC is to have discussion. Um, but like, what have you seen when you know there are two parties that are like really passionate about the way you know they want to take a specific thing, like a design or whatever? Um, and how do like from a community standpoint, how do you all handle? Um, like when when the two sides don't see eye to eye because we're doing like the RFC process at work and it, it works pretty well um, and like I like the the visibility of it so that you're kind of showing um, you know technical directions from different points but like sometimes we get into these things where it's like it's like my way is better or, or right. the other way is better so how do you kind of like what have you seen? There. I mean, I, I have seen that one of the most effective things we do is when people are getting into huge butting of heads in GitHub comments, there's usually, you know, hundreds of them at that point, we close down that RFC and reopen a new RFC with the same content, but we start with a summary of the discussion that has happened. And that forcing that break a little bit, even if it's just going to a different page, that does often help calm people down a little bit. Uh, the ultimate decision, as I mentioned, it depend it's the Rust team that's uh, dedicated to, uh, uh, to that part of the Rust ecosystem. So occasionally we have had someone in the way, the best way I've found to disappoint someone is to start with why. And so when we do take a design in a certain way, uh, we say, this is why we are doing this. These, these are the arguments that persuaded us. And these are the experiences we expect our users to have. Now that said, has we have had a few people, very few, but a few people get so upset about a design system that they leave for a few months. That's okay. That really is okay. If they, if, if it's something that they need to work out on their own, that is okay. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, it's difficult. People are hard, I, I would say, but there are ways to make it less difficult than it needs to be. And over to Ooh, you. Thank you. Awesome. That was, that was great. Um, and it, it talks about like, um, you know, we, we all are very passionate about code, but um, you know, it's, it's more about the, the people behind, you know, the, the systems and the, the code stuff that we actually end up writing. Um, and, you know, especially now where, you know, more, more folks are like remote and everybody's in, you know, in distributed teams, I think it, it does end up playing a, a, a much bigger role. Um, all right, so I'm going to share my desktop and 
We'll see how, how this goes. All right, so you should be seeing my whole screen. Yep, we can see it. Carl. And uh, awesome. Um, thanks for thanks for the invite, y'all. Uh, as 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 uh, Jason mentioned, um, I'm in Austin. Uh, we have power. Uh, we have water, uh, yeah. and you know it's a it's a glorious thing. Um, I until like um, last week, there those are like things that we just took I, or I just took for granted, and now I'm like. You know, it is nice, like having the sun out uh, and, you know, not being snowed in. And it is nice, you know, turning your heater on and uh, when it's really cold outside. Um, but enough about that. Uh, I'm here to talk about um, my, I don't know if it's my favorite topic or, or where it ranks, but um, it's certainly something that I've been spending a lot of time doing uh, with Kubernetes. So uh, I was going to spend some time. Uh, basically talking through like uh, the idea of a Kubernetes operator, what it is, um, and then, um, you know, kind of going into like a demo of actually seeing some of the stuff work. Uh, I used to work at Oracle. Uh, so I used to work with Jason uh, and uh, a bunch of folks uh, on the call. Um, it, Oracle's, uh, Oracle Cloud's hiring a lot in uh, the Seattle area. So, you know, go talk to, go talk to Jason. I don't work there anymore, but you know, the, the environment is really good. Um, so I, uh, about like eight months ago or something, I got interested in the idea of doing this, um, thing with continuous verification and chaos engineering. It was kind of like an inter interesting idea for me. So I made the transition to go, uh, to a company called Verica, uh, that does like chaos engineering and continuous verification. And, uh, I did a lot of Kubernetes stuff at Oracle. So, um, you know, it's, uh, doing a bunch of Kubernetes stuff here at Verica right now, um, given this talk a few times um, and, you know, a lot of people end up asking me about like chaos engineering stuff. And I'm like, well, we, uh, you can actually just get the O'Reilly book. If you go to verica.io uh, slash book, um, that's the whole like book that Casey and uh, Nora wrote. Um, so they're better. Uh, I, I know I've, I'm learning more about that, which is why I joined the company. Uh, but, um, you know, you, you get a hands-on look of like what, you know, a lot of these things mean. So today, and I apologize for, uh, I don't know, the ghetto way of doing this. I, I know I could put this in present, but I'm, I'm back in engineering. So I'm like, the presentations will be, will be worse, uh, but the code will be more, or at least that's my like mental, mental motto for it. So, uh, but I think the, the font size stuff should still be okay. Um, so this, all of this should still be readable. Um, so from an operator perspective, you know, like, uh, one of the saddest things is when you Google Kubernetes operators, uh, and, you know, I happen to do this a lot because it is kind of buggy at times. Uh, so when you Google that, you end up like finding all like, if, uh, how do SREs work with Kubernetes and how do people, uh, you know, work with Kubernetes and, uh, Kubernetes maintenance and, uh, all of that stuff. So that's like not any of the stuff, uh, I'm going to talk about today. Um, you know, we, you can ask, we can, we can chat about that after the talk, uh, if there's issues with, you know, how to handle Kubernetes from, um, from a people perspective, but this is more about like the software, uh, that runs behind the scenes. So it's a software pattern that we use inside of Kubernetes. Uh, and this is where you create custom resources to manage applications and components. Um, and so what this really means is this is actually the idea of a Kubernetes operator is extending the. Uh, Kubernetes API, uh, it becomes a part of the control loop. Um, and it's basically, you're running an application inside of Kubernetes that allows you to like do something with the Kubernetes API uh, more than, you know, just running a, uh, you know, an, an application in Kubernetes itself. So one, probably the question that comes up a lot is, you know, I, if you're like, what is the use case of using an operator uh, versus why would, like, why would I use an operator versus, um, you know, hey, I can do a lot of these things just using Kubernetes API, whether it's, you know, kubectl or, uh, you know, you can also create Helm charts to deploy uh, Kubernetes applications. Um, you know, what should you use where? So the, the thing that uh, is important to think about from this perspective is that if you're trying to, you know, add some more control over a lifecycle of an object, 
uh, that you're creating or you're trying to create or extend the Kubernetes API in a specific way, uh, you know, that's that's where you'd probably want to use an operator. If you're trying to build an application to uh, control and manage Kubernetes applications. So let's say, for example, you know, we have, uh, you, have you might be running, I'll take MySQL as an example, right? So you can put MySQL into, into a pod and you can run that um, to a set of pods and run that inside of Kubernetes. But uh, when, you know, MySQL, you have to do a replication or something breaks or whatever, and you have to like, um, you know, do something to, uh, you know, either scale those pods or bring them back online. Uh, you want added controls. So you're like basically building an application to like control the MySQL application uh, that's running in Kubernetes. You know, that's an operator's good choice for that. It's probably um, also the most common use uh, of operators today. So if you get, um, you know, like most companies today end up having like a operator that helps you, allows you to install uh, you know, their software on top of Kubernetes, uh, and then it just handles the whole like life cycle um, of everything that's going on in there. Um, or, you know, if you need to access internal uh, cube components, for example, for us, uh, we do a bunch of, uh, you know, it's uh, continuous verification or chaos engineering. So you need to know like the state of, you know, Kubernetes inside. Um, a lot of those things are not accessible via the API. So you want to be sitting inside of the cluster itself uh, to be, uh, you know, to get some of that info info out. So, you know, being inside uh, or in, it's an outside versus inside problem. Um, so examples in here, you know, there's the chaos engineering verification. So like one of the things that, you know, we use it for um, is, uh, so we actually uh, do, um, do chaos engineering for Kubernetes specifically, we use an operator to run verifications. So anytime you um, have some kind of action with Kubernetes resources like pods, for example, you know, we want to know like, hey, this new pod was created uh, or, you know, some deleted a pod or something like that. Uh, we can actually tie into the lifecycle of things uh, to be able to uh, get information about uh, things that are already running inside of the, in, inside of the Kubernetes um, cluster. Uh, this could also be, you know, it, I talk about pods over here, but it could also be custom things that you create uh, yourself. Uh, so it doesn't have to be something that already exists. It can be something that you, um, you know, generate by yourself as well. Uh, Finite gain control over resources in the cluster. So if you want to do like timing or if you want to do like traffic shaping or thing uh, like that, you can use an operator too. Um, and also like for, for us, it's like uh, the state management. So verifications um, or your experiments always have some kind of state. So you want to know like what the, what the state of that verification is. It's nicer to just store it as a, uh, as a CRD uh, inside of the cluster versus you know, storing it in an external database and then uh, querying that database over there and then going into the cluster to go look at something. Uh, it just ends up being cleaner, storing all that information inside of Kubernetes. Uh, what languages? Uh, probably the most common ones uh, that I've seen are Go. Um, there's also a bunch of stuff with Ansible and Helm. Um, Nell, Nell talked a lot about Rust as well, and I looked that up right before the meeting. So there is a Rust adapter if you uh, want to use Rust as the language to, uh, you know, write um, uh, write an operator. That's totally like a supported language now, uh, which is which is pretty neat. Uh, but in terms of like the, I think a couple of slides. Well, I talk about the maturity model in just a second. But uh, from a from a lifecycle perspective. Um, your uh, operator, the SDK for the otter, um, you can do like a build, test, or an iterate kind of model. So uh, you uh, you do the installation part of the operator and you can do that locally. Um, one of the nicest things about it is that you can actually test just on your, on your laptop uh, or like in your local environment. Uh, and then you can kind of push it out uh, to build like the manifest and the Docker image and whatnot uh, for the operator. Uh, once you're happy with you know how everything works, and we'll kind of go in into um, into that into a little bit more detail. The other thing that's really neat about it is that um, you can run your operator on your machine, but you can test it against whatever cluster you have running um, locally as well. So it's like you don't have to deploy everything to like a you know a staging cluster or something like that if you choose not to. You can do that do that work locally, test against whatever your target is, and then once you're happy with it, okay, let's go ahead and publish it out. 
In terms of maturity model, um, th this is something that um, one of the reasons it's kind of like this, like uh, it has, we have a bunch of phases uh, when, you know, folks are just trying to use it for, you know, automated application provisioning or config management where, you know, you're just trying to like install your software to run on Kubernetes and handle all the, the life cycle of that software. Uh, that's probably phase one. And then you go all the way to the, to the right, which is the autopilot. Uh, and that's like, I haven't seen um, an example or like dug into the code uh, of something like this, where, you know, you have an operator, operator that's doing like horizontal and vertical scaling and like auto config everything, um, uh, abnormal uh, detection and whatnot. Um, but the, the interesting thing about all of this is um, the, the, the support from a language perspective. So Kubernetes being Go um, and, you know, the, the whole ecosystem kind of like being built on Go. Uh, if you write an operator, uh, you probably get the most, um, uh, the most flexibility uh, if you write it in Go. Uh, or Ansible, uh, but you can also, you know, there's a lot of times uh, if you're, especially on the SRE side of the house and you're like, man, I, I really don't want to start writing, like picking up a language and writing something for it. You can also kind of, you know, use use Helm uh, and use the idea of uh, a little bit more configuration versus, you know, going and writing, um, uh, you know, learning a new language basically uh, to go do the work. So, um, but you know you you can do uh, everything you want with a hum chart for an operator. Um, but if you end up using Go, you can kind of uh, basically plug into the whole model for um, for Kubernetes, basically. So um, let's go ahead and and take a look at you know what the heck I'm talking about. Um, a lot of this seems very amorphous. Um, so what we're gonna do is I'm actually gonna run through uh, the install and we're gonna install the um, SDK, get an operator up and running and then see it running in a cluster and like um, actually see the code behind it. So um, pop over to VS Code um, and then get this up, make this a little bit bigger. And what I'll do, so I have this, um, I have a cheat sheet that I wrote uh, that we're essentially going to run through. Um, pull this back up. So the two things that that you really need uh, to run this locally is uh, the you really need the operator SDK, um, and then you need uh, you know you need Go. I'm going to uh, show the example of how you do this with Go. Um, so I already have like uh, the operator installed. So operator SDK. Uh, minus max version, or I guess it's actually just version. So I'm running 142. Um, I literally just did this before this uh, meetup like an hour ago. So I was like, man, I hope all this stuff works. Um, and so, you know, we, we might uh, crash and burn, but uh, if you don't do a live demo, then, uh, you know, so there's, uh, you don't, you don't get all the joy from it. Right. So in the past, what I've done is I've actually just deleted these folders, but I'm kind of kind of nervous about this, so I'm not gonna delete um, the the backup folders for this just in case something goes wrong. Uh, but uh, per our cheat sheet, uh, oh yeah, you can also install the lifecycle manager. Um, this is it gives you additional tooling if you want to like understand. Uh, what's going on from the lifecycle part, but it's not something we'll actually run into today, but you know, just something that's there. Um, ah, I'll make it about that big. And so I'll create a new directory. And I'll go into sample operator. We'll see something brand new over here. There's nothing in there. Uh, I'm going to do an init. So this step, uh, basically is just um, saying that I want to initialize the operator SDK. Uh, I'm going to do it for an example.com domain uh, and then just give it like a specific repo, uh, which is the folder. Um, all this is doing behind the scenes is it's getting all the things that you'd need to actually run uh, the operator locally. So if I look at my, um, if I look at my sample operator, um, 
folder that I just created will notice that, you know, there's a project, there's a make file uh, and a bunch of like files associated with that. So this is basically what it's done is that it's initialized the operator. Uh, now what we actually wanted to do is, you know, go and create the code that um, allows you to, you know, actually build the operator. So I'm going to go copy this out. Um, and so basically what this is doing is it's creating the API. Uh, we need to give it like a, a group and a version um, and the, the kind of the operator. So I'm just gonna call it hello uh, version, you know, V1 alpha one. Um, so this V1 alpha one, it's pretty common in the Kubernetes community where everything starts with the alpha version, then it becomes a beta. And then, you know, it actually becomes a, a V1 version. So we'll just, you know, call, call it that. Um, kind Seattle meetup and then resource and controller passed in as well. Um, maybe one quick thing I can do is while this is doing its thing, I can run that. We'll notice that it ended up adding something to controllers. Um, and then um, it should have also added something to our, to our APIs as well. So at this point in time, um, it's basically, we have everything that we need uh, to run this. So let's go ahead and you know take a look at our code real quick. So close this stuff out. So we have a main file. Um, so for the folks that haven't done a lot of Golang stuff before, you know, the main is basically you know, where, where you come in to the application. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff here about like metrics binding, whatnot. Um, and then we create a new manager uh, for this. Uh, and then we have a reconciler. Uh, so this is the, you know, the Seattle meetup reconciler that we ended up creating. So if I actually go to the definition of this, uh, you can actually go into controllers. So the reconciler, um, probably the most important thing with, um, you know, probably everything I'm saying today is, um, there's uh, for the operators to work uh, and just Kubernetes in, in general, um, the life cycle of all of your objects end up having a reconcile loop. So whenever you know there's any state change in your um, in your uh, object or life cycle or something like that, the reconcile loop is called. So uh, let's say you we create a new pod, right? Um, so for that specific pod, uh, you know. It, it sends in the request uh, and it sends in the context. Um, that pod will be reconciled at that point in time. So anytime there's a state change in inside of Kubernetes, uh, you can end up adding, um, this gives you a hook to that, to that actual state. So we can actually add a logic in here. So that's, that's like one thing from a code point of view. The other thing that's important is um, if you look at our, um, when, when we create this initially, um, we end up having, uh, so we have like a Seattle meetup types. So all of our, um, all of our Kubernetes in general, um, our objects have like a, a spec and status. So in here, uh, by default, it'll just throw like this thing called foo. Uh, and you know, foo is just a string uh, and it can have some value. So uh, when I want to control, uh, want to add like data or whatever, I can add it to the spec of this specific thing. So in this case, I'm just going to leave it foo. But you know, if you're, you're um, you know, if you're creating an operator and you're trying to add, uh, you know, data or something like that, you would basically add it to the spec over here. And so the other thing that we can, actually, well, let's just let's just get this to run real quick. And I want to check one thing real quick. Um, want to see. On my cluster, I want to check if I have CRDs already because if I do, I shouldn't. You can tell that I've been running this like a bunch of times. Um, so if I so continuing on with uh, what we want to do, um, I can actually run this run this locally. So if I do a make run on this screen. Um, this is basically going through, uh, you know, it's going through the motions to build out 
um, all of the code behind the scenes, and then it ends up erroring because it's like, hey, uh, looking at the actual error, uh, it says, you know, error controller runtime. If kind is a CRD, it should be installed before calling the start. So this is it's erroring for, for me because I don't actually have um, anything called Seattle Meetup, uh, you know, already residing in the cluster. So it's it's looking for this kind of object inside of my cluster. Uh, before we can actually, you know, uh, run the CRD uh, or um, run the operator. So it's a common pattern that we have from a Kubernetes perspective. So in order to do that, let's go and um, we can just do a make install. And also if I do kubectl get CRD, we'll notice that, you know, I just deleted it and you all saw that, but we can use that as a reference. The make install will actually go and install uh, the CRD uh, on the cluster. And it's like, oh yeah, custom resource definition, blah, 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 created. Uh, let's go ahead and verify that. So yeah, we do have that thing created, you know, just, just right now. Um, so now if you do a make run, this should actually like start up it's not going to do anything exciting because uh, there's, you know, it, it's basically at this point in time, it's just waiting to see if there are, if there are uh, any state changes inside of, um, you know, inside of Kubernetes or if there's any new applications of, of kind Seattle meetup uh, that it can go and like do something with. So nothing great right now. So how do we actually use this? So in our, um, when we define all of this stuff out, uh, it actually comes drop with some samples. So um, when we created our Seattle meetup um, uh, CRD uh, and, you know, when we created the operator for it, um, it dumps this like nice little, um, you know, a sample thing of what we can actually run. So we can actually, you know, go ahead and go ahead and try and like run this. And so if I go to, um, Sample operator, um, kubectl apply minus f. Uh, config samples and hello, blah, blah, blah. So what this is doing is this is taking this manifest and actually putting it on top of Kubernetes as a um, as a kind of Seattle meetup in Kubernetes. So I can actually do a kubectl get, and it'll say, hey, there's there's a, there's an object called Seattle meetup that's already running in, uh, you know, that we've just basically installed on, on KNS. Um, I don't think this would have really done anything here uh, because if you look at our, our actual code that was running, in the controllers, in this Go code, there's you know really nothing nothing over here, so it's like not showing us anything. So let's actually go and add some code to it. Um, I'm just gonna I copied this over, so I'm just gonna take this and put it in our reconcile loop. So make this one tad bigger. We'll talk through this really fast. So the reconcile loop. Uh, like I said before, um, anytime there's a state change uh, with your with your CRD, uh, this will go. This reconcile loop will, loop will execute. So you know uh, what I'm doing over here is you know I'm just putting a log statement in here saying hey you know reconciling the Seattle meetup, um, and then um, I'm creating an instance of the Seattle meetup object, uh, and then from the actual um, you know, from the context, I'm gonna get the uh, get the instance val value of whatever is passed in. So whenever I pass, um, you know, whenever I pass this, uh, you know, this Seattle Meetup object, I'll actually get that in here from a running from a running system perspective. Uh, and then basically, what all we're gonna do is we're gonna print out instance.spec.foo. So in our Meetup, we have like this is our instance spec dot foo. So we should see bar uh, when, when we run this. So cancel out of this, let's do a make run. Um, I will, 
I'll clear the screen here. And then I'll go back in here. And then instead of bar, let's call this um, Jason. Is Jason's on my screen. Um, and I'm going to apply that. So this says, you know, the meetup is configured. We look at our screen and we have nothing. Uh, that's not what I expected. I was thinking this was, oh, okay. So pro tip, when you're coding live in front of people, make sure you save your stuff because if you don't, um, nothing's actually going to work. So stop that, start it up again. Sorry about that. Uh, oh, there we go. So actually, it did it did pull it did pull it um, because it did find it existing already um, inside of um, you know it it was already running as um, uh, as a CRD. So let's go ahead and actually update this to something else. Um, let's call it Dave. So that thing when it ended up being configured, uh, we look at this uh, in our in our output. We're like, hey, uh, you know. The, the actual value, it said it's reconciling again. Uh, and then it pulled in like a new value uh, of Dave, of, of, which is basically what we ended up passing. Um, one thing we can do is I can try and do a delete minus F. So I'm gonna delete this value. Um, and we're, this is going to crash because I was basically pulling pulling the instance and, you know, pushing something out, but it kind of tells you that, hey, it's actually trying to execute the, uh, you know, when we're, um, you know, when we're actually running through, uh, running through this, um, you know, through the demo. So let's pull it back up again. And let's go ahead and change um, something here. So that's that's up and running. It's good. We'll do an apply again. Uh, we'll and we'll notice that you know we have Hello World up and running here. Um, I can uh, I can go. Let's create another one because I feel like I'm just um, doing the same thing over and over again. Um, and you know, uh, typically in real world, uh, you end up having multiple. Uh, you know, uh, you end up having like multiple objects that you're kind of playing with. So uh, let's call this meetup.yaml. The contents can be the same for it. Um, and then we'll just call this JSON again. And we, instead of this, the, the original sample, Um, you know, once again, we notice that it's basically like reconciling, um, reconciling that object as well. So, um, so effectively, um, if I do a kubectl um, get Seattle meetup, we we can see the oh, you know, you know what? Um, I should have called this a different. Sorry, so I created a different file, but I ended up calling the same name. Uh, which is not really helpful. So let me change the name of this. So sample two, and if I do get the, you know, get get all the meetups associated with it, you know, we'll we'll notice that I have you know different objects uh, that are actually running over here that are associated with, um, you know, um, so the like what we've done is you can have a bunch of different um, you know, different custom objects that you're creating from uh, an object perspective, they can have their own properties, et cetera. Uh, and, but you're still kind of like in the Kubernetes lifecycle, like when this when this controller is running behind the scenes, uh, your controller, Kubernetes is telling your controller, hey, I found, you know, the Seattle meetup, uh, there was some state change over here, go and do something with it. And so that's where our reconcile loop that we've written uh, over here, this is where we actually go and like do some kind of whatever action we want associated with that. So um, that's really all I had. I kind of wanted to, um, when my intent with the presentation was like,
when I did this the first time, like there's, there's so many docs on like, here's why you should use an operator and here's like all of this, this stuff, but it was hard to kind of like understand how this worked from a, from a code perspective. So I just wanted to like, you know, create something, something out that uh, made sense from that perspective. So I'll be able to, or I'll be, I'll, I will try to answer like any questions that folks have uh, with operator stuff. Thank you, Karthik. And I have a question because I'm working on Kubernetes operators right now at work. Um, have you found it difficult with the change from the operator SDK to the 1.0 version? Because I find when I like search for information, I get the outdated zero dot docs for everything. Even the operator book doesn't have the current things and they change the command structure significantly. Uh, yes. This what you are saying right now is a nightmare. Um, in fact, if you look at our code, right? So I've done this a few times. Um, the initial operator, like this was the code sample for it. It was a lot cleaner before. Um, and I think this was like 0.7 or something like that. Uh, the last time I gave this presentation was in the no, no, no time frame, I think. And then I have like another folder that has like some of the info in there. So. Um, there is a lot of change. One thing that is important, I think, so we actually use uh, version 0.9 um, at work. And so I uh, not really like gone and like upgraded to 1.4 uh, like I did for this, uh, this specific presentation. It does feel like they are trying to separate a lot of pieces out, uh, which is good. But once you've started in like an older version, like I actually think we've started at 0.7, then I didn't upgrade to 0.9, um, and you know now there's I, I need to upgrade that again to 1.4. Uh, the good things that they have done are they talked about like the upgrade path uh, in in the docs, uh, which is which is great, but it is it is a little complicated, uh, and I don't know if there's like an easy way to be like, oh yeah, you like they we rolled a new version of the operator, go and use that. Um, it's still a little painful, so there's still some dev time that you need to spend uh, getting it to work. The, from the directory structure perspective, um, that does change a little bit. I haven't seen it change too much uh, in like the last year. Um, I think like pre point six, there was like, things were just like flying all over the place. So it was like hard to even know what the heck um, happened. But uh, the, the, I think the important part is at least um, all like the reconcile loop still ends up being the same. So, you know, the worst, worst, worst case is like, you generate a brand new operator, put all the code that you need in the reconcile loop, um, and you know you just like do a do a drop in uh, like that. Uh, I don't the, I don't know the upgrade path. <laughs> what you just said. Yeah, I don't know if that's the best way. There's got to be a more elegant way, but like I had to do that when I went from like 0.7 to 0.9, and I was like, I don't understand what just happened here. Um, so it's cleaner to just like start a new project and then just bring your code in. Um, and so like having having a modular kind of way to do that, you know, is, I don't know if it's state of the art, but that's that's kind of like what I, what I end up doing a lot. All right, we have uh, another question. Um, how are operator lifecycle events exposed and modified? Are they standardized or can you come up with your own wacky alternatives? You mean like, um, what do you mean by lifecycle events? Uh, so that was asked by Alex, so if, or Alexander, sorry. So if they want to unmute and clarify, that would be helpful. Or just post into the chat. Ah, hi. So, uh, sorry. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, Alex and James here. Yeah. So, um, well, uh, maybe if I kind of give you the motivation to make a right? So, uh, part of it, when I look at the operator lifecycle, Right. I can see that there's many different potential things that you can do with it, like auto healing, uh, auto scaling, all kinds of other things. Right. But if you want to kind of like set up a kind of stage deployment or something like that, uh, it doesn't seem super. I'm not, I'm not sure kind of basically how you could uh, extend that lifecycle or kind of like uh, change it or basically how you. Uh, is this something that you're defining as the operator owner or is it uh, something that standardizes part of Kubernetes? If that makes sense. Um. Most of the examples I've seen and like a lot of like the stuff that we do uh, just end up with 
like the life cycle of objects with Kubernetes in general. So like, you know, they go through the, like, what is it? Like not ready, uh, pending, ready, uh, like those kind of life cycle phases. I don't really know um, if you can extend that to adding like uh, a new phase, like let's say like before ready, like have a pre-ready or something like that. I'm not sure about that. Um, anyone else has tried that or done something cool with it? Great. I guess not. <laughs> well, I, uh, <laughs> it seems useful for like new stuff, right? Anyway, sorry. Yeah, no, what, what I would do um, on that is like actually just ask that question. Um, I've gotten really good traction with like asking questions in GitHub um, with the operator SDK, um, you know, just I've just filed tickets. Uh, even when I've had like crashes and stuff like that, I'm like, I don't know why this is crashing. Uh, and it was like something that was specific to my environment, but I was like, I don't know. But like the Red Hat folks are, uh, you know, pretty good about actually even like, you know, communicating back with you, which is which is pretty powerful. So not sure if I do find out, you know, I'll, I'll definitely pass on the message to to Jason, but it, I feel like operators are like bleeding edge and, you know, adding a new like life cycle stage to it is like bleeding, bleeding edge. <laughs> okay, thank you. That's really right. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna be the <laughs> well, uh, if we can, I'll let you know as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, would you typically do field validation in the reconcile, or is that handled elsewhere, like before reconcile is called? And that was from David. Um, Need more clarification. I think the well, it depends. Right. So your um, when you define the um, the schema, so it it um, if it's a schema related issue where you define your CRD and you have like specific things you put in there, um, if it doesn't conform to the schema of what uh, you're expecting, you know, then like Kubernetes is just going to be like, I don't know what what the heck this is. Uh, so it's going to like throw um, you know throw an error at you. But if you're if it's something like let's say you end up adding. Uh, you know, we just had foo and bar, right? So, uh, but in, in the bar thing, if I ending like specific JSON that's custom for my application uh, and that your application goes and interprets in some weird way, uh, then, you know, you need to have like a validator uh, on the reconcile loop to go and read a lot of that information out as well. So, um, and, and I've definitely seen that pattern as well. So I think you can kind of do both. Um, but if like simple use cases, uh, most, most of the time you just end up defining like a schema for what you want for like inside of your CRD uh, for like the object that you're creating. And so, you, you know, you're pretty much good to go over there. Uh, but once you start like trying to like twist it in, in weird ways, you, it totally allows you to do that because like, you know, Kubernetes can solve world, world hunger. Um, if you like tweak it in like some, some magical way, but um, you know, it, it, it it will end up getting complicated too. So that's like a random warning from my end. Thank you. Thank you, Karthik. All right. Well, yeah, give me just a second to put the screen back up. Awesome. I just really wanted to thank the crew, everyone, for joining us today. It's awesome that we can reach someone as far as Austin um, or, or whatnot to be able to come and present to our group. Um, I, I'm just really grateful for both uh, Karthik and Nell. Um, one last thing, uh, we, we really appreciate our sponsors. This, this month has been uh, Circle CI. Without the sponsors, we wouldn't be able to do this event and keep it free. So in the spirit of that, if, if folks have more questions or whatnot, um, they can reach out to me uh, and uh, we can set some something up. All right, and reminder, our next meetup is Wednesday, March 31st, same time, 4 to 5.30 Pacific. We'll have two more talks by some great friends in the meetup. Um, Aaron Aldrich will be talking about sticking together while staying apart. And Quintessence Angst will be super with Prevent Terrorism, how to work today to reduce work tomorrow. Um, if you want to see more about that, I uh, posted a link to our site for those upcoming talks. And if you have any feedback, I'm about to post into the chat a link for a form for you to send us feedback. And folks, we're always looking for good speakers and great content. So I know there's some great ideas into this audience. So we would love to hear from you. 
Um, really appreciate your time and uh, we'll see you folks next month. Awesome. Great to see you all. Thank you. Thanks now, Karthik. Have a good one. Thanks, y'all.